Great. Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, an iSchool uh, seminar, or actually our webinar in access and inclusion. Uh, also, diversity is something that we are celebrating uh, in our school. Uh, my name is Kristen Rebman, and I am the chair of the iSchool's diversity committee. And one thing that we've done for many years is to invite speakers that celebrate, promote, and develop programs and services uh, relating to inclusive excellence. And this year, we have a fantastic panel that was coordinated and arranged in collaboration with um, Mich Dr. Michelle Viagran, one of our new faculty members. And so I'm so pleased that this uh, webinar has come to fruition. Uh, Michelle's going to tell us more about our speakers, which are Reed Garber Pearson, Micah Karine, Sunny Kim, and Bean Yogi. So thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot of people here today. Uh, we'll also be, if you can't stay the entire time, we do, will have uh, recordings of the entire session. And it looks like some resources uh, relating to our topic today, transgender inclusion in libraries, uh, will be shared uh, on the website where we also post uh, the recording. So Michelle, I'm going to let you jump in and introduce our speakers in greater depth. Thank you, Kristen. So hello, everyone. Um, today we have a great panel of four uh, speakers. Uh, their full bios are available on our website with the announcement materials related to this webcast, but I will give you a brief um, introduction to each one. And I'm going in alphabetical order of a last name. So Reed Garber Pearson is the Integrated Social Sciences and Online Learning Librarian at the University of Washington, where they have worked since 2016. Garber Pearson is currently serving as the President-Elect for the Washington State Chapter, of the Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL. Barbara Pearson is interested in expanding what community looks like and talking about identity in online spaces. Micah Carine is a current MLIS student, currently one of my students, at San Jose iSchool and a library associate too for the Seattle Public Library. They grew up in a small town where the public library was central to the community and have been passionate about libraries ever since. Heron believes that public libraries must explicitly center equity and social justice in order to truly provide access for all. Sunny Kim is deeply honored to live and work in Seattle as a teen librarian. They love building strong relationships with young people, geeking out over science fiction and comic books, and serving the community. Before becoming a librarian, Kim spent a decade working in community for social justice. And then Bean Yogi is an indigenous Uchinanchu public library worker and an at San Jose MLIS student as of fall 2019, based on Kawamish land. Their work in libraries focuses, uh, centers around the intersectional lives of queer and trans black, indigenous and brown people through a transformative justice lens. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters who are going to be toggling in between and will introduce themselves as they transition. So take it away. This is Micah. Thank you so much, Dr. Viagran, Dr. Redman, and Nancy uh, for inviting us here today. We are excited to be here. I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Bean, who is going to open us up with a land acknowledgement. Hi everyone, my name is Bean and I'd like to start our session today with a land acknowledgement. Uh, the four of us are broadcasting from the traditional homeland of the Duwamish tribe, who are the original, present, and future stewards of this territory where we live. Um, these lands that we are situated on are subject to the Treaty of Point Elliot, though its terms have been consistently violated, and even to this day the Duwamish remain federally unrecognized. Uh, we make this land acknowledgement in order to honor the legacies, struggles, and existence of indigenous peoples, to situate ourselves within settler colonial projects, including libraries, 
to disrupt the erasure of indigenous peoples and to continue the work of collectively learning and fulfilling our obligations for those of us who are uninvited guests of this territory. Um, and land acknowledgements are made usually at the beginning of events and gatherings. You can learn more about uh, the importance of land acknowledgements and how they're being applied to libraries in the resources and readings document that uh, Reed shared over chat. Um, and we'll get more into that uh, by the end of the workshop. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna quickly introduce ourselves. Um, again, my name is Bean Yogi uh, and I use they and them pronouns. My name is Sunny Kim, and I also use they, them, and their pronouns. I'm Micah Carine, and I also use they, them, and their pronouns. And I'm Reed Gubber pearson and I also use they, them, and their pronouns. <laughs> so you might notice that all of us use the same pronouns. Pronouns are just the words that we use to refer to someone when we're not using their name. <laughs> And in some languages, pronouns are gendered. So using the correct one for every person requires a little bit of intention. Um, examples of other pronouns that you might hear folks use are she, he, and z, though there are many more than that. Um, and you may have also heard pronouns described as preferred pronouns. Um, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, to us, pronouns really aren't preferred so much as they are mandatory. Um, and we'll get into more of that in just a minute. Great, so this is Reed speaking again. And really quickly, I'm gonna just outline the two goals we've set for today's webinar. Um, we've done this workshop in like four hour time spans and we've done it in one hour. So this is like a very shortened version of, of this presentation. But today we're gonna learn about transgender, queer, and gender non-conforming people and uh, their experiences. And so we're gonna learn about some practices for engaging those folks. And we're gonna also introduce some ideas for creating safer spaces for transgender, queer, and gender non-conforming patrons through language, programming, and policies. All right, so this is now Sunny speaking. Um, before we get into sort of the meaty part of our content, we wanted to make sure that folks had some common language so that we were all speaking to each other instead of across each other. So um, I just wanted to, before I launch into some definitions, make a quick note about terminology. Um, language, especially for uh, communities like queer communities, often changes a lot over time. Um, and it's hard to be able to predict what is going to be the term that makes the most sense for the most amount of people at any given point in time. But if you need a good rule of thumb, um, it's important to just remember to respect the self-determination of all people. Um, another point is that we're going to be sharing some words that discuss uh, things like identity, so who you are, um, but also things like sexual orientation, so who you love. Um, and then we won't go too deeply into it, but we do wanna make a point um, that gender is a, uh, as a concept, is a social construct um, that is defined in our society as a binary, so male and female. Um, but uh, we know for a fact that that binary is actually false. Um, the uh, existence of trans folks, the existence of intersex folks, all of us serve to sort of explode that binary. So if you've never heard the idea of gender as a binary, please do some uh, research into that and um, learn more on your own time. Oops. Okay, so um, the first definition we want to make sure people understand is that transgender is um, actually an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or gender expression um, differs from what's usually associated with the gender they were assigned at birth. Um, so this includes a lot of different identities underneath that umbrella. Um, cisgender is actually uh, sometimes I have heard some people say that cisgender feels like a slur to them. But in actuality, cisgender is just a term that's used to describe people who identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. So cis is actually um, Latin for on the same side as. Uh, so again, it's just a descriptive word. Transgender woman or trans woman um, is a person who is a woman, is a woman and was assigned male at birth. So just to be clear, um, if you are talking about a transgender woman, you're not talking about uh, cisgender male. You're not talking about 
uh, you all you're talking about is a woman who is uh, who is assigned male at birth. Okay. Um, so, and the picture here shows Laverne Cox, who is an incredible actress and LGBTQ advocate. Um, the next definition is transgender man. So similarly to trans woman, uh, this is a person who is a man and was assigned female at birth. Um, and pictured here is Teek Milan, um, who is a writer, public speaker, activist, and media consultant. He's currently um, a spokesperson for GLAAD. Okay, so now we get into the term that describes um, people who don't fit into the binary. Uh, so non-binary or genderqueer, these are two terms um, that are used by some people who experience their gender identity as outside um, the binary. And so all of the presenters here today um, identify as non-binary. But that doesn't mean that uh, we all experience our gender identities in the same way. Um, there's no one experience of being non-binary in the same way, there's no one experience of being um, a trans woman or a trans man. So uh, for some folks, you might identify uh, as just as, a, uh, as one gender. You might identify as both simultaneously. You might identify as one or the other, depending on what time of day it is. Um, and it's really very, varies a lot. And you just have to check in with the folks who identify that way to really understand. Next, we've got, did I skip one? I skipped one. Uh, the next definition is for gender nonconforming. That describes a person whose behavior appearance doesn't conform with the typical ways society expects us to behave. Um, and so gender nonconforming people are not necessarily uh, identified as trans, uh, but they're folks who play with gender um, and fall outside of the ways people expect us to present. Uh, transition um, encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, for many people, this is a super complex process. Uh, for some folks, um, uh, opt into some parts of transition and other folks opt out of certain parts. So transition is a very personal thing. It doesn't look the same way for any one person. There's no valid way to transition or invalid way to transition. It is just your personal journey to being yourself as fully as possible. And intersex. Um, intersex is a term that's used to describe a variety of conditions in which a person is born with um, reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the typical definitions of male or female. I encourage you to really look into this um, identity a little bit more. Um, there is a super great documentary coming out by Pigeon. Um, I think it's called A Normal Girl. You can look into it online. And... That brings, that wraps up the definitions. I'm passing it over to Micah. Hello, Micah here. Uh, I just wanted to share with you all this graphic, the gender unicorn. It is created by the Trans Student Educational Resources Group. And we bring it to you today. It isn't our favorite graphic, but we do appreciate that it was created by trans folks. And we do think it helps folks uh, see what we mean when we're talking about all of these different things. So the first thing you'll notice here is gender identity. And you'll notice that that is what the unicorn is thinking about. It's not something that's visible to anyone uh, from, it. it's not visible to anyone. And so in order to know what the gender identity is, you have to ask the unicorn. So it's something that uh, you can see varies. It could be man, woman, it could be other, uh, but that is the gender identity. Gender expression on the other hand, that's represented by the green dots, that refers to uh, kind of the external ways that someone might present their gender. Uh, that can be what someone wears, if they paint their nails or wear makeup. It's also, you know, the way someone holds their body, the way they walk. Uh, you'll also notice it includes sex assigned at birth year, uh, included, represented by the chromosomes. Uh, that could include female, male, or intersex, as Sunny just spoke to. It also speaks to attraction, uh, whether that's physical, emotional, and those are both uh, spectrums. So folks can be physically and emotionally attracted to different genders of folks, and those might vary uh, between the two. Um, this is just, we just wanted to illustrate how complex and nuanced identities are along each of these categories. And we can't assume anything about anyone based on someone's gender identity or presentation. And as Sunny mentioned, we all identify as non-binary, uh, but if we, the four of us plotted ourselves on these graph, on this graph, we would all have very different results. I'm gonna turn it over to Bean again. Okay, hi everyone, it's Bean. Um, 
I, I know that um, some of you may have uh, arrived at this workshop hoping to, to know um, more about the capital T transgender experience. And unfortunately, that is not what we're here to share with you today. Um, if there's one thing that we, we'd like you to leave with from this webinar, it's that um, having a trans and or a non-binary identity is truly full of mystery and nuance. There is just nothing you can know for certain. Um, there's just no explanation or breakdown that's a one size fits all. Um, but outside of a loose definition that can shift and grow over time, as our cultures do, um, we know that trans and non-binary genders look, feel, express, and move differently for everyone. Um, and just to demystify what is inherently fluid, um, I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, the first is that indigenous cultures have known for a long time that gender isn't binary. Um, there are some examples um, in the graphic uh, on the right that just describe only some of the, um, what you could call non-binary genders um, around the world. Um, and we, we wanna lift this up because um, for some of us who are really stuck on um, conflating what um, our sex assigned at birth um, is and what our genders are, um, we just want to point out that there have been forever and for a long time um, different structures and gender systems through which we can understand not only our bodies but um, just how we like live and move in the world. Um, and if you have any insights into um, these gender identities or other gender identities from your own experience, um, from your own background, um, feel free to share resources in the chat. Um, another thing we wanna point out is that uh, many transgender folks transition socially and or medically, kind of as Sunny um, was pointing out. And so there really is no official checklist that you must go through in order to be certified as trans. Um, and I, we think that's important to point out because sometimes um, trans and non-binary folks get um, regulated in conversations about um, whether they really are trans or not. And so I think, you know, we'll get to this at the end, but one thing you can just do is trust people to tell you who they are. Um, we wanted to name that a pretty common narrative in mainstream media these days is the idea that trans people were just born in the wrong body. Perhaps they're a man who is just trapped in a woman's body and they're like struggling to get out. Um, that is a narrative that resonates with some people. It doesn't resonate with everybody. Um, and the reason why I think it's important to name that is because um, there, there is a way sometimes that trans folks can have uh, their narratives um, sort of taken out of their mouths and um, repeated as like a universal. Um, and we just wanna be really careful not to assume that we understand how any particular trans folk, um, trans person identifies um, the experience of living in the body that they live in. Um, let's see. Another one is that um, sometimes when people are introducing themselves and they're sharing their gender pronouns, they may uh, say that they identify with male pronouns or female pronouns. This is just one of the ways that we can sort of like uncouple um, the idea that um, certain language like inherently is or isn't male or female. Um, there are plenty of non-binary people who use for very personal reasons, um, he or him pronouns, she or her pronouns. And so um, what we wanna do is just um, focus on the gender identities that people share with us and try not to assume that we know what, what those gender identities are um, right away. Um, hopefully it goes without saying that um, being transgender is not a mental illness, not because there is anything wrong with having mental illness, but specifically because, um, again, there are different social structures um, that have been put into place um, to regulate trans people and to other them. And we just, uh, we just wanna say that the experience of being trans um, is, not, uh, is not something that we can just easily um, conflate with um, a disabled experience. And yeah, having said all these things, um, 
trusting people to tell us who they are, I think is the main, the main thing that we'd like uh, to impart today in our website or in our webinar. Okay. Um, one more idea that we really want to keep front and center in the work that we're doing whenever we're talking about um, marginalized identities and inclusion uh, is the concept of intersectionality. Um, Professor Krimberly Crenshaw is a legal scholar and she was the person who first coined um, the term intersectionality. Um, intersectionality is the idea that social identities and related systems of oppression intersect to create a whole that is different from just the component identities. So in terms of gender, you could say that um, racism, classism, ableism, all these other forms of oppression impact the access that trans folks have to, you know, trans affirming healthcare um, or to the legal system. And that, you know, these multiple, multiply oppressed identities result in an experience that is unique. Um, there is no one transgender experience because of intersectionality. Um, and so one way that we wanted to illustrate this um, is to consider how black trans people experience different levels of social discrimination that um, non-black trans people don't experience in the same way. Um, in 2015, 24% of all black folks in the US were living in poverty. And that we know is uh, more than twice the rate for white folks in the US. Um, and then, according to the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, nearly 40% of Black trans folks were living in poverty. And so just seeing um, that kind of like confluence of um, anti-Black racism and how that impacts people and also how transphobia impacts people, we can see that there is um, a connected but also unique experience that, um, you know, that Black trans folks have um, because of the intersectionality of their experiences. Um, and what we, you know, without just sort of repeating a lot of um, statistics to you, uh, we also want to name and surface that within Black trans communities, um, when we apply an intersectional framework to understanding um, what those experiences are, we know that Black trans women in particular face um, targeting and violence that uh, is at an increased rate. Um, and we just can't talk about intersectionality and gender without naming um, those differences in experience so that we honor those experiences and we, um, and we don't just conflate people. Um, because when we do that, we more often than not skew towards uh, the folks who have um, the most privilege and the folks who are the least impacted um, by multiply uh, marginalized identities. And we just want to take care not to do that. Um, intersectionality isn't all, um, you know, doom and gloom, though. If we are using an intersectional lens um, to think about transgender inclusion in libraries, then what we're doing is we're getting even more nuanced and intentional in thinking about how to shift, you know, not only our uh, organizational cultures, but also our programming and our services. Um, having services that are more trans inclusive really isn't just about creating trans specific services and programs. Uh, it's understanding that trans people are part of all of our communities, including immigrant, disabled, poor, homeless communities, et cetera. Um, and so if we make every aspect of our programming and public service more trans affirming, um, then we're really doing the work. Um, and I just want to uh, point out before we move on that making our libraries more trans inclusive doesn't only benefit trans people. Um, cis folks benefit from gender affirming spaces too. Uh, and when we lift from the margins, we really are uplifting entire communities. Thank you so much, Bean. This is Micah again. Uh, so Bean started to touch on this, but we really wanted to spend some time talking about why this is important for librarians. And so we wanted to think about this in a number of contexts. Uh, between the four of us, we work in public and academic libraries. I also have uh, some past and special libraries. Uh, so we just wanted to let you all know some 
some reasons why this is so important for the work that you do. The first thing is avoiding unintentionally escalating situations by having the skill set to engage with transgender folks in ways that are uh, humanizing. And this is really important because this is an opportunity to build connection rather than burn bridges. Uh, when you're working with students, community organizations, uh, all sorts of users and customers, you're going to be interacting with trans folks. So having the skills to have relationships with folks is really important. Uh, also in public library settings, sometimes in school library settings, uh, you might have to engage with someone who um, is struggling to be in the library for one reason or another. Uh, and if you address this person and misgender them, you will escalate the situation. Which brings us to the next point, avoid misgendering users. Trans folks are regularly misgendered in their everyday life. While making a mistake about their gender, uh, is often accidental, it is also very hurtful and can be very impactful and make a safe, uh, make a space far less safe. Um, you cannot assume the impact that uh, misgendering someone has, but even if it wasn't on purpose, it doesn't mean that it didn't hurt. So learning to refer to people and use uh, non-binary and gender inclusive language is a huge step in making our libraries places where transgender folks feel seen and respected. The next is uh, having a deeper awareness of the barriers transgender individuals face, um, and this will help you advocate and make institutional changes. When we do this as a longer workshop, we spend a lot of time on this. In our resource guide, there's actually an institutional assessment that allows you to look through your institution and think about ways that your institution could do better. I wanna bring forward one example that was shared with us at our presentation at ALA Midwinter. There was uh, someone who was visiting from a health science library at a university connected with a major hospital. Um, and they had a student that they were working with who had experienced some pretty intense transphobia while receiving medical care. And that library was able to work with the university hospital in order to improve the care that that transgender individual uh, experienced. And so even when it doesn't feel like your library might have a lot of power in these situations, that's an example um, that the person shared that was something that they never expected would happen, but they had so much power there. Next up uh, is just a reminder that you will have transgender coworkers. You might not realize that they're transgender, but you will have them. Uh, and so don't forget the impact that transphobia has on your transgender coworkers um, and their transgender family members. Having coworkers that continually misgender you or don't understand their language can create a really hostile environment. There's also a lot of barriers that your transgender coworkers might face. Uh, one example is if your library or company that you work for offers health insurance that covers gender affirming care. That's something that a lot of organizations do not. Uh, there's been a lot of growth around that recently, but it is really important and can really change uh, someone's quality of life. And finally, it's really important to undo structural violence and harm. When something is a default, you don't have to be intentional in order to not cause more harm. Transphobia is not just hate crimes. It's also continuing to center cis people and cis experiences as the norm. This is woven into how we think culturally. Unless you're thinking explicitly, about trans people and marginalized folks. You're going to be upholding these systems and continuing to cause harm. To not do that, you have to continually and actively challenge them. Libraries and the worlds that we uphold are structures. I'm gonna turn it over to Reed now. This is Reed speaking again. And following that, we just wanted to give you some really brief best practices for how you in the work that you're doing, any of us in the work that we're doing can uh, make safer spaces or spaces where trans folks can be more seen and acknowledged um, in our workplaces and out in the world, wherever we are. So first is don't assume anyone's gender. So we've already said this, but until someone tells you your gender, you won't know what it is. Um, so based on looks or appearance or name or, or even somebody's pronouns, you, you won't know somebody's gender. Um, and also ask yourself, is it important to know somebody's gender to get their pronouns right? Those things uh, um, can be distinct or can be connected, but always ask and don't assume. Um, and if someone tells you their pronouns, use them. Even if they're not around to hear those pronouns, make sure if somebody states what their pronouns are, use those consistently for them. 
Third is if someone tells you their gender, use that gender if you refer to them later, similarly to using pronouns. Again, even if they're not around. Transgender and trans are the most inclusive words to use and are always followed by nouns like person, folks, people, man, woman. Transgendered with an ED at the end, that's not a word. Um, transsexual is an outdated word that we don't recommend using. Um, it's a medical word and we're not medical professionals, at least the four of us are not. Um, some people may still use that word for themselves and um, respect that those are words that people use for them, um, but it's a word that we don't recommend using for other people. Um, Words are really important for some people whose daily lived experiences are filled with a lot of disrespect and continuing violence and shame. Words can be a really crucial channel for communicating that people's existence is worthy of dignity and care. Um, next is don't ask trans people about the particulars of their bodies or surgeries they've had or that they might want to have. This is uh, none of anybody's business but their own. Um, so we should never be asking anybody about uh, their bodies. Lastly is um, pronouns take practice to get. Um, if you know people who change their pronouns or who regularly, regularly change their pronouns in your life, um, you might get those pronouns wrong. So it's really important to practice on your own time getting those pronouns right because it does take work and it may not just come naturally. So next I'm gonna hand this Next, I'm going to hand this over uh, to Micah and Sunny, uh, who are going to show you um, an example of how to apologize when mistakes happen. This is Micah again, and actually, I wanted to bring us back one step before when we make mistakes, and this is uh, how to learn someone's pronouns so that we do not make mistakes. So one way that you can do this is when you're introducing yourself. Mind you, it's not always important to know the patron's pronouns. Uh, if it's just a fleeting interaction, you can use gender neutral language, which we will cover in a moment to refer to them. But if this is someone that you're building a relationship with, it is important to know their pronouns. So when you're just getting to notice someone, one thing that you can do is introduce your own pronouns first. So when I go into a space uh, and we're doing introductions or I'm meeting someone one-on-one, -on -one, I start by saying, my name's Micah, I use they and them pronouns. What pronouns would you like me to use for you? And that's a way for someone to let you know what their pronouns are and to not feel like uh, often trans folks are the only ones who are being asked their pronouns. And so for cisgender folks, it's also very important for you to normalize that by sharing what your own pronouns are. If I don't catch someone's pronouns right away, perhaps I meet someone really in passing or it's a large group, I might approach them later and say, you know, I didn't catch your pronouns earlier. What pronouns would you like me to use? And then also let them know my own. Uh, also when in meetings, when we're going around, uh, it's become a norm in most of the meetings that I am at, at the library I work for, that we not only share our names and what uh, location we work at, but also our pronouns when we're in spaces with new individuals. So just to share a couple of ways that we can do that uh, before we talk about mistakes happen. So once you know someone's pronouns, uh, you can potentially make a mistake. And so we wanted to talk about how to apologize. The first thing is it's really important to be brief. Uh, we don't want a lengthy drawn out apology that really just centers the experience of the person who made the mistake bringing it to the importance of focusing on the person, not the guilt that you are experiencing about having made a mistake. Uh, finally, uh, you, we, it's important not to name that you know the impact that you've had. Uh, it might not have been a big deal to the person or it might have been really significant and uh, broken some trust that that person had built with you. And then you do wanna name what you're going to do differently in the future. We have all experienced incredibly uncomfortable apologies uh, when folks have gendered us incorrectly. So we wanted to share with you some examples of how you can do this well um, and how you can do this not so well. Uh, so we're going to start off with a bad example and Sunny is actually going to share uh, an apology that is one that is based on one that they received. Um, it is also similar to some apologies that we have received while at library conferences. So this is not an uncommon apology. Take it away Sunny. 
Uh, hey, Micah. Um, I'm so sorry I called you here earlier. Um, I'm trying really hard to get your pronouns right, but like they is, it refers to multiple people and I really struggle with that. And like, I just need you to understand that I'm, I'm not a bad person and I'm trying really hard and like, it would be really great if you could help me. And like, I just feel really terrible and I'm so sorry. So that's one way to apologize. <laughs> Dean is going to offer a uh, much more humanizing approach to apologizing. Hey, Micah. Um, I'm sorry I used the wrong pronouns for you earlier. I'm just going to keep practicing and get it right next time. So that is a way to apologize that centers the person who uh, has experienced the misgendering and is simple, it is brief, uh, and these are things that I'll just go back to it so you can read it one more time. Um, this is something that is really important to use when you are, uh, this is a great template of what's really important to use when you're apologizing to someone. Uh, Bean likes to joke that if you can't remember it, you can just get it tattooed somewhere. Uh, you can do whatever you need to do to uh, have a good apology so that when you're in the moment, when you're activated, when you're feeling embarrassed and flushed, that you can go to something that you already know how to do so you don't get caught in your words like the person who apologized to Sunny like that. I'm going to pass it to Bean. Uh, okay, um, another, another question that um, we've been asked um, as we presented this webinar is, how to interrupt misgendering that we see um, in front of us that isn't necessarily a mistake that we've made, um, but just when you are speaking with your colleagues or um, in the workroom or something. Um, so we wanted to offer you some examples. Um, before I begin, I just, I, I wanna bring up like one caveat to all of this that I think is really important. Um, sometimes, people are not out about their gender or their pronouns. Um, they may have shared that with, you know, those um, things with you because you have a trusting relationship or because, um, you know, you took the time to check in with them about what their pronouns are. Um, but there are definitely people who um, don't want their pronouns to be common knowledge yet. And so um, it's always a good idea to check in with folks that you have an ongoing relationship with in your life about if and when they would like you to correct people who are misgendering them. So, you know, one example of that is that um, for, for myself personally, um, I ask my coworkers to correct other coworkers who are misgendering me, but not to correct patrons who misgender me um, because I have a bit of a boundary about processing my gender with patrons. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if you're taking the time to ask someone, hey, what pronouns do you use? Um, you might also consider asking them, you know, a follow-up question, which is if, um, if somebody else um, uses the wrong pronouns for you um, in the break room, would you like me to correct them? All right. So back to um, mistakes happening and us all being human. Um, let's see, if somebody, if somebody were to say, um, you know, use the wrong pronouns and they uh, have been told the pronouns before and you're just trying to remind them of something that they already know, one thing I find pretty effective and pretty gentle um, is to like essentially repeat the thing that they said, only use the correct pronouns. So it's almost like you're just like demonstrating to them what they should have said. And, you know, when I've done that in the past, I found that people usually pick up on it right away and they're like, oh, right, right. Um, so an example of that is somebody saying, um, oh, I got Bean's email and I forgot to reply to him. You could say, oh, you forgot to reply to them? Question mark. Um, if you are talking to somebody who, or you're, you know, observing um, somebody who may not know the pronouns of the person who they're talking about, um, you can also very simply say when there's a break in the conversation, you know, I think Bean uses they and them pronouns. Um, you're not accusing them of anything. You're not shaming them for making a mistake. You're simply just giving them some extra information 
I have found that for the most part, people respond to um, a gentle but firm correction like that really well. Um, you know, one thing that is also very human of all of us is to uh, get flustered in a moment um, where we don't know exactly what to say, we haven't practiced interrupting, um, misgendering, and we let the moment pass. There is no problem at all about circling back. Um, I've done this not only in the context of um, intervening on misgendering, but also, you know, if somebody says something that uh, is, you know, like racist or um, homophobic or, you know, ableist, uh, there are times where I might be sort of shocked and I might not know what to say in the moment. I take a second to kind of like center myself and recollect and then I circle back. Um, so you can do this in the context of gender as well. One thing you can say is, hey, I forgot to mention this, but Bean uses they and them pronouns, not he and him. Um, you could also say, when you were talking earlier, I heard you use he and him pronouns for Bean. Actually, they use they pronouns. Um, doing that is not weird. Um, it's not, you know, it's not any weirder than um, somebody doing that for you when you've accidentally communicated the wrong policy to a patron at your library. I've had coworkers do that and I've been, you know, always very grateful. Um, so I think that as long as you are approaching um, these interventions in the spirit of uh, relationship building and not in shaming people, but really just helping them, you know, get things right, um, most of us generally uh, really appreciate that. So those are just a couple of examples. All right, so this is back to Reed speaking, and I'm going to go through this slide pretty quickly since um, we've provided the slides in the um, workshop and resources notes. Um, and so you can come back and look at this, but you will see and you have heard in both chat and as we're speaking to you all today that we have not been using any, any gendered language like guys or men and women or ladies or anything like that. Um, and there's, these are some really easy and simple language options to use that don't assume gender on anyone. So we've been using everyone. Uh, we've been using y'all and you all and folks a lot. Um, and there were some questions earlier about how to, um, how to ask somebody their gender or how to um, gender somebody if you don't know what their gender is. And so these, for that question earlier, these are some of your options for children, for individuals and referring to groups. So I will leave it there for now um, and know that you can come back and try practicing um, talking with some of this language. Thank you so much, Reed. This is Micah. This is our last slide. Uh, I'm going to try and do this quickly, but it is meaty and important. So the first thing that uh, for inclusion in library programming and spaces is going beyond Pride Month. Um, so this can refer to things like book display, collection development, readers advisory, and book talks. Doing those things all year long when you're celebrating Black History Month, including Black trans folks. When you're celebrating Women's History Month, including trans women. Uh, and this also applies when you're ho hosting lectures, social media features, things like that. Uh, do them year round. Don't just do them as a tokenizing thing during the month of June or in November uh, when there's a uh, trans, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. There are some trans specific holidays in November that we can tell you more about in the Q&A. Uh, so that's really important and that's something that makes sense in archives, that makes sense when you're working in a business that does social media, that makes sense when you're in, ac in an academic setting and hosting lectures. The next thing is when you're doing this centering own voices. Uh, there are so many pieces of written by trans folks about the trans experience. For example, this presentation today, there I have attended presentations on this subject done by cis folks. So when you have the opportunity to host these sorts of trainings, particularly if you are paying folks to do these trainings, it's very important to uh, think about uh, including trans folks. So this also applies to uh, the books that you're, you have at your library, uh, but also, you know, if you're featuring folks in your archives or you're sharing scholarly publications, thinking about who's writing about their own experiences. And this applies to all sorts of identities, not just trans identities. The next thing is involving community and programs and initiatives. So you're not 
not just inviting the community to attend these programs and initiatives you've planned, but including trans folks in planning and implementing them every step of the way, uh, and by and showing that you value their input by paying them. That's really important. And when you're doing this, you also wanna make sure that you are including trans folks with a variety of identities, not just including uh, white able body trans folks, including trans folks of color, including disabled trans folks and other individuals with uh, a multiplicity of identities. The next thing I have on here is making your ILS trans affirming. So that is, things like you're having how you include folks' names in your system, uh, what information you record about name changes, as well as if you record gender. There's a link to it in our resource guide, but American Libraries actually just came out with an article earlier this month about how uh, it doesn't make sense for libraries to include data about gender um, and how a lot of libraries hold on to that because they say it's important for their data. But unless you're also including uh, data about folks' race and about their ability and things like that, your data actually isn't, having gender as part of your data isn't actually strengthening your data. So there's a great article there. Next up, uh, improving restroom accessibility. Uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, create new structures, adding gender neutral restrooms, uh, but we know that that's not always the case. So if you only have gendered restrooms, don't question a patron's choice of restroom. Also, do you know where the nearest all gender restroom is to your work location? I've been asked that before, so it's been useful to be able to direct folks to a coffee shop, a building across campus, things like that. And then, as we've mentioned a lot, represent trans folks from all communities. Honor the complexities of identities. People have more than one identity, and it's really important to make sure of your inclusive of trans folks with uh, other intersections in their identities. So that's what we have for our slides today, and we want to go ahead and turn it over to Q&A. Uh, so do folks have questions for us? I just want to jump in and say thank you so much for these presenting these slides and what a cohesive presentation you were able to extend to us. Um, I had a, a question or actually just a comment on your final slide where you mentioned go beyond uh, uh, awareness month or uh, and how we can uh, communicate with our community members all year long so that it's not this sort of tourist approach to doing equity, doing access and inclusion, and uh, truly making a commitment to our community members. I thought that was a really important point. It's something that we talk a lot in serving uh, all of our community members, that it's not just about this one month. It's every day, all year long. And I thought that was really important for everyone to hear. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. We just, um, we know that in the, you know, participants, we aren't like of this uh, webinar, we are not the only people with knowledge and ideas and resources. Um, and so we just wanted to, um, you know, share some of the things that have been coming up in our chat box. Um, first, it looks like, um, OS and Alvar were uh, just naming some of those um, observances that uh, relate to trans experiences. Um, one is the Transgender Day of Remembrance. Another one is Trans Day of Visibility. Um, there's even a website that you can go to to learn more. There's uh, tdov.org. Um, we also uh, heard from Lori G that um, at Lori's uh, library system, um, there are keys to a female and uh, male gendered restroom and uh, Lori and other staff there have started offering both keys to folks who are asking for restroom keys, which I think, you know, uh, is a great practice when you don't have uh, like single user um, restroom options available or when you don't have gender neutral options. Um, let's see. This is Micah. Maggie also asks if we would recommend stating pronouns on a resume. I think that's a personal decision. I do not include my resume, my pronouns on my resume, uh, but I do know folks that do. So I think if, uh, I think it's 
up to folks. I think Sunny has something to add. So I don't put it on my resume, but I'll put it at the bottom of my cover letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, if you are thinking about doing this um, as uh, a trans person or a non-binary person, um, you know, again, it's a really personal decision. And if you are a cis person who is trying to think of uh, ways that you can normalize um, sharing and extending gender pronouns, um, you know, in, in more avenues of um, interaction, I think that, you know, those are, those are great ways um, to do that. Um, someone else mentioned a little bit earlier in the chat that um, they have uh, seen folks um, including gender pronouns in the signature of their emails, um, regardless of whether you identify as trans or not. And, um, you know, that that's a personal decision, but I know for me, um, you know, personally, uh, I've felt um, really grateful when I've seen that happening more and more in the like library field. Um, so yeah, we would definitely encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable. I noticed that Tiffany asked a question about if we have any advice for trans staff engaging in advocacy as staff and members of the uh, LGBTQIA communities. Uh, this is personally me speaking as Micah. Uh, I think the most important things for me have been finding my people. So doing this together with Bean Reed and Sunny has been uh, a really beautiful thing to do, even though it's been incredibly difficult. Uh, we have been misgendered so many times while doing these presentations. Uh, we've had some really hard experiences uh, with library staff. The first time I did this training, I did it for a specific population of library employees. Um, and I was asked about the particulars of my body and what surgeries I've had, which is why that's now added to our slides. Uh, so I think have finding my people and uh, building relationships, having folks that I can talk to about uh, this work and the difficulties there, uh, and then also having really strong self-care practices. Uh, those things have been really important to me. I don't know if anyone else has things they want to share. Um. I would just add, like, uh, as library employees, there's an element of our work that's always about how we interact with each other and how our systems work and all of that. Um, but there's always, um, to my mind, the very important work of how we interact with our communities. Mm -hmm. And so if you're advocating for queer communities within your library, um, some things that I uh, think are very important are um, following up, being accountable, um, really doing some deep and careful listening, being transparent and honest about what you can and can't offer from your system, mm -hmm. um, following up with people and giving them updates. Um, I've learned a lot, uh, particularly from uh, Black women at uh, Seattle Public Library who have been leading community engagement work um, in really accountable and thorough ways, um, how to really um, actually do community engagement that doesn't just surface level tokenize people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sunny, for sharing that. Uh, I want to speak to, this is Micah again, I want to speak to a question in the chat before I do so. Um, someone named Andrea asked a question that I'd like some more clarity about. So Andrea, if you're listening, please clarify that for us. Uh, the next question I want to answer is, can someone share more about the use of they, them pronouns um, as opposed to using singular pronouns like she, her? I just want to clarify that they, them is a singular pronoun. Uh, this is historically how it was used in Old English, but also uh, according to you know, the Webster's Dictionary, it is a singular pronoun. It was actually the word of the year in 2016. Uh, singular they as a pronoun. So uh, just to clarify, it is a singular pronoun. It can refer to one person. Um, and it is uh, a way to refer to an individual without gender. And so that can be used for someone that you don't know the gender of, as well as folks who uh, have said that the pronouns that they use are they and them. Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that, um, you know, what how I um, understand whether um, the pronouns they or their um, is being used singularly or um, plurally really depends on the context. Um, so, you know, I, I think that when, um, for example, at my library, we have lost and found. And um, when we um, find a jacket, you know, on the ground, we might say, oh, um, to, the, to the folks 
you know, in our vicinity, we might say, hey, did, did anyone lose their jacket? Um, that's, that's kind of a natural way that we do use um, the singular they, and we just don't, uh, we aren't necessarily encouraged to think, to think about it in, in a singular way. Um, so yeah, like Micah said, it is, uh, was Merriam-Webster's uh, word of the day um, in a recent year. And so, what? Word, of the year. word of the year. Word of the year. Oh, this <laughs> and so, you know, we just, um, yeah, we just encourage folks to uh, check out the resources document if you uh, need a little bit more information about that. This is Micah again. I saw a really great question from Catherine, uh, and that is, my library's policy is that we have to put the name on the account that matches their government ID, which I know can be problematic for some trans people. Do you think there are is any way we can mitigate any harm that causes. Mm -hmm. So I have actually been involved in some rethinking about these policies at the Seattle Public Library. So I'll speak a little bit to what those policies are. So for the Seattle Public Library, for folks that are under the age of 18, uh, for folks that are 12 and under, you know, their parents are just filling out a form signing saying that they are who they are. Uh, we don't, you know, require any photo ID for our youngest patrons. So if there is a young person who's changing their name, regardless of if they have legal paperwork, we just have them fill out a new library card application um, with their parents' signature. And then that way, uh, we're entering that into our system like we would for any other child. For folks that are 13 to 17, uh, we have, for our users that are 13 and older, uh, we do not disclose uh, information to uh, anyone else on the account. We do, uh, we do disclose uh, fines, like the amount of the fines to a parent, but we don't, uh, we don't inform them about the content that it's on. So uh, we have uh, special things in place for our 13 to 17 year old users so that they can change their name. Uh, and that is something that as they are under the age of 18, we recognize that they might not have full access to doing legal name changes, so we don't require documentation for that. For users that are 18 and over, we have a variety of different uh, forms of ID that folks are able to use. This in can include something like a work ID. It also can include a debit card. Uh, and so we uh, accept a whole lot of different IDs. And so for someone that might not have their name on their legal ID, they might from the government, they might have it on, uh, for instance, their student ID and their work ID. So those are ways that we can do that. We also accept uh, affidavits of name changes. Uh, and so our affidavits of a kind of the common name that someone is going by. So even if they don't have that legal name change paperwork, those are ways that we can do it. Uh, we also allow folks just to use their initials on their library card applications. So that can be a way uh, to uh, help someone receive library service without the risk of being misgendered and having that uh, risk of violence uh, towards them uh, as well. And then there's one more thing I was gonna say there. Oh, name changes. So when we do do name changes for folks, we no longer, hold any information about the prior name on the account because that was data that we were just basically needing to keep safe that we weren't doing anything with. Um, so in alignment with our values as a library, because we didn't need that information, we no longer track it, which is another way to protect the privacy of parents and people in libraries. Um, Andrea, Andrea um, brought up a really, I think a really excellent point and then sort of a follow-up to their question. Um, they wrote, if um, one is genderqueer but not uh, op like out or um, open about it at work, um, but also wants to support staff, patrons, and other initiatives, um, just navigating how to be supportive without having to out yourself. Um, and Andrea pointed out that it's a lot easier for cis staff to talk about their pronouns at the beginning of meetings or in their email signatures, um, but there are definitely a lot of people who are still navigating their pronouns and that can be that can be an uncomfortable uh, question or situation. Um, yeah, I just, I wanna appreciate you for, for raising that because I do think that, you know, <clears throat> as, as awesome as it would be to have, you know, best practices that always and absolutely affirmed um, everybody's gender and everyone's um, like experiences, you know, that just isn't, there just isn't a practice like that, unfortunately. Um, there are definitely pros and cons to having um, pronoun check-ins at the beginning of meetings. Um, and there are definitely people um, who are trans or non-binary who wouldn't feel comfortable um, including pronouns in their email signatures. So just wanna appreciate you for pointing that out. Um, yes, it is true. 
I have something real quick to say um, for any of anybody who's on this webinar that identifies as trans. Um, there is a Slack group for library workers who are uh, gender variant. It's called Gender Variant LIS. So I believe it's gvlis.slack.com. Um, and that's actually a really great resource. So if you have um, questions like that, there are a lot of people who have been sharing their own experiences and advice in navigating transition at work, um, which is one of the sub uh, threads in there. And just to clarify, that is a resource that is available for uh, gender nonconforming, transgender, and questioning folks. That is not a resource for cisgender individuals. Yes, thank you. Uh, and so we are right at time. So I think that that is all the time that we have for questions. You'll see that uh, being Micah, her mom, that's me, Bean Reed and I have <laughs> our names uh, and our contact information listed here. Uh, Sunny is at capacity. They get so many conference requests for some other cool work that they're doing. So the three of us have capacity to answer questions, to pass along resources and things like that. Um, so thank you all so much for your time today. Uh, we've, uh, we're so glad that we are able to talk to you all about this. And this is Dr. Villagran. I want to just thank each of you for your expertise, your time in sharing this with all of us. I think it's critical and important and I'm just grateful we could put this all together and make it happen. So thank you so much and we'll make sure to get the recording posted as well as this link and capture the other uh, links and resources that came through the chat and share it on our website. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. What a wonderful uh, presentation you've shared with our community today.